Hello everyone, I'm just gonna start the Zoom, one moment. Okay. Got this. Happy Monday, I hope everyone had a good weekend, as good as we can have these days. Oh good, I see people are here in the classroom already. Join with computer audio, let's make it big. <clears throat> okay, so this works, and I want to make sure that I can hear something. And as usual, we'll do a quick sound check, um, because I just, I just activated the Zoom and I just realized I activated the Zoom from speakers that were off. So let me quickly double check and make sure that my audio settings are on. Good, they're on. Okay, I think we're ready. <clears throat> Can we do a quick latency check? If you see me, please wave your hand. Good. Okay, let's start. So we are now going to talk about a new, I guess, a, a fun last part of this class. And the last part of this class has to do with linear algebra and extremal set theory at the same time. Um, earlier in this class, I actually had already mentioned linear algebra a bit. And that linear algebra had come in way, way, way at the beginning when I was talking about Ramsey numbers. And I was talking about how you can make a construction for graphs with no big clique and no big independent subset if you use a certain linear algebraic type construction, where we took a bunch of vectors and we took somehow the inner product to say whether there was an edge or not. This was something over F2. And that's actually the, the direction that we're going to move in for the next, uh, for the next few weeks. But I'm going to start by showing how this can be generally useful, even in situations where it doesn't look like there's any linear algebra to, to play with at all. So here's a fun theorem. Suppose that you have a bunch of subsets of the numbers 1 through n. Suppose that a1, a2, and so on, up to a n plus 1, just a second. A n plus 1 are subsets <coughs> of square bracket n. Then there exist disjoint subsets of indices. So then there exist disjoint subsets i and j. These are subsets of indices. And I just want to emphasize indices are like 1, 2, 3, up to n plus 1. So that means that i and j are subsets of n plus 1, because that's where my indices come from, such that if you take the union of all of the a's with indices in capital I, that's equal to the union of all the a's where the indices are in capital J. So I can write it like this. Maybe I'll say something like little i in capital I, AI, is equal to the union of little j in capital J, AJ. That looks like a 1, AJ. OK. So this is an interesting statement. This is a statement that's somehow talking about extremal property of if I have a bunch of subsets, how could I try to know, that I, I mean, somehow, like, as soon as I have this number of subsets, then automatically there's going to be two unions which are the same. Um, there's something interesting in this theorem also, which is that it's best possible. Can anyone think of a construction that breaks this if you have only n subsets? So again, this is a statement saying if you have n plus 1 subsets, then there's always going to be some disjoint, oh, oh important, non-empty, disjoint and non-empty. I'm not allowed to cheat. I cannot go and say ij are empty. Uh, Philip, yes. Yes. So there's an observation, which is that this would be best possible. Because if you had somehow each of the a's, if they were just 1 up until n, that's a strange curly brace, has too many curls, uh, 1 up to n, only n of them, then not true. Okay. 
Now, if somebody gives you this problem, at the beginning, this problem just looks like any old problem about sets. And you'd probably try to prove this by induction or something. Actually, this is a problem which I've seen appear in some Olympiad contests in the world before. Uh, somehow some country had made this question uh, an Olympiad question. So obviously there's like standard ways to do these kinds of problems. And it seems so simple. I mean, there's just a bunch of subsets. So surely you could do some kind of a case analysis or some kind of an induction on N. But here I already gave a hint, and the hint was that we're going to move into linear algebra territory. Once you know that the hint is something is going to involve linear algebra, if you look at this, what do you think? What about this smells like linear algebra to you? Feel free to raise your hand. What part of linear algebra might we try to use? Like the basis, yes, thank you, Ariel. So somehow there's like a basis where there's like an n-dimensional space, maybe, and then there's going to be n plus 1 things in it. So I think what that means is we should probably try to think about vectors in an n-dimensional space. So let's do a proof. Proof of the theorem. What we're doing here is we're going to try to say, suppose we have each of the a's corresponding to a vector. each ai correspond to some vector, uh, which is a vector in some space. So it's some field, right? Vector spaces have a field uh, to some dimension, which is dimension n. And can anyone suggest what this should be? What could we do? Yes, Matthew. Oh, <laughs> I see. So there's a suggestion F2 to the end. And I think if you said F2, that means you're probably thinking of making each one of those vectors something which is a 0, 1 vector. And that's probably what Matthew was going to say also. So it's got a bunch of zeros and ones. And the correspondence is that somehow you just look at where the ones are. These are called the characteristic vectors of a set. So over here, this particular vector Let's maybe say what this was. Um, I guess this vector is actually the vector 2, 3, because it has a 1 in position 2 and a 1 in position 3. So we could make a correspondence like this. Oh, yes. Are we concerned about the a's being distinct? Actually, it's OK if the a's are overlapping. If the a's are, this, uh, sorry, if the a's are, are repeated, then it's trivial. You just find two different ones. I see that there was a chat. OK. Latency feel higher today. So I don't know. I actually intentionally checked that this time. So I'm not sure if the latency is higher today, but I intentionally checked right when I was doing the YouTube stream. So I'm not really sure. We're still in the ultra low latency mode. It might be because maybe the way I'm choosing to write down something is like I was actually trying to buy you some time to maybe say something. OK. But yeah, thanks Thanks very much for the comments. Um, I, I, I try to pay attention to that detail too. OK, right. And I, I want to emphasize, it's OK if I have a, a1 equals to a5. If that's the case, I would just say make the capital I be 1 and the capital J be 5, and you're done, nothing to prove. OK, so I have these. Now what would you want to do? Make sure you are live. I'm not entirely sure what that means, Liam. But uh, we, uh, in any case, uh, this, this is running live. I think, this, I think the settings we're using today are the same as the ones we're using before. I actually don't understand what you guys just did, but I'm happy to see that. OK, good. So, so now what should we do? We have these like, <laughs> oh, it's OK, guys. You guys are awesome. OK, right. So I have, I have an n-dimensional space, and I have n plus 1 vectors. And presumably, what everyone is trying to do, everyone is trying to say, let's just go and use linear dependence. right? So there's definitely going to be a linear dependence. That's how all of these proofs work. So now I have n plus 1 vectors. It's OK if they repeat. The linear dependence still holds, because a vector is certainly linearly dependent with itself. I mean, a second copy of itself. n plus 1 vectors in n-dimensional space implies there exists a linear dependence. OK, but what are we going to do with this? If we have a linear dependence, uh, what does that mean? That means, I guess, we can write down some coefficients, right? Let's write down some coefficients and put the vector, and they have to add up to 0. So I'm just going to do an example. So what I might have is I might have uh, 
I might have like somehow there's some coefficients, right? So it's maybe C1 times this one here, which has some zeros and ones, plus maybe there's a C2, and maybe there's a 1, 1, 0, 0. Oh, I have to count now. Are there six things? Yeah, there are six things. OK, I shouldn't have drawn six things. It'll take too long. I won't draw all of them. But you know, C3 times something, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. I'm lazy. We keep going. And all the way to, I guess, it goes to C7 times. We have all of these. And maybe 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And that supposedly is equal to all zeros. OK. How could this be useful? I now know that I have this thing, and this is over F2. Actually, you should be really worried at this point, because F2 is not very useful for what we're trying to do. I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out that some things are unions. And the problem with F2 is that 1 plus 1 is not 2. 1 plus 1 is 0. So in fact, what this is telling me is it's telling me that Somehow, linear combinations, by the way, over F2 also mean that you have some of the Cs be zeros and some of the Cs be ones. And if I'm doing that kind of a linear combination, I'm basically just saying, pick the ones which are ones, because the ones which are zeros, you can just ignore. Zero means ignore. One means keep. So I basically have a, you know, a few of these things. And if I just kind of superimpose them on each other, they cancel out. They have an even number of ones in each row. But that's not quite what we want. So it looks like linear algebra didn't work. Does anyone have any other suggestions? <clears throat> so given that I told you this is a linear algebra section, there has to be something with linear algebra. I also just gave you a hint that F2 is the problem. Philip. OK. OK, so now we're getting somewhere with maybe a hope for some differentiation between i and j. Actually, one second. I just realized that we have a speaker on that's reflecting the sound that I'm making. Because I was wondering, how come I hear myself so clearly? Let me turn that speaker off. I'll be right back in about 15 seconds. <coughs> Great, thank you very much. OK, uh, the only reason is because it makes like an echo, which uh, you, you may or may not hear it. It, it muddies up the audio. But OK, right. So uh, the idea was over F3 because, you see, we have, we're looking for a capital I and a capital J. And all we know is they're disjoint. And also, they're probably not going to be union to everything. We don't need that. So we need to maybe have three different possibilities. And so the thought over F3 is that you could say the I's are the C's, which are 1. Uh, uh, so the C things which are 1, the J's are the C things which are minus 1, which is 2, and everything else we just ignore. That would definitely give you I and J disjoint. That's true. But it's also kind of a little bit annoying still, because if I try to add these things up, how does that have to do with unions? You see, with, with unions, somehow, if I'm adding up plus ones and minus ones somewhere, I almost need that all the plus ones. Like If we think about what this would make, like all the plus ones, would need to combine in a way that the, 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 like the ones that they correspond to with the plus ones exactly are the same modulo 3 as many of them as there are ones in those locations corresponding to minus 1 coefficients. Does that sort of make sense to people? We're basically bundling by we've got some positive 1 coefficients and some negative 1 coefficients. And maybe actually let me write that down, because that is part of the useful idea. Okay, um, And I see also Anthony has a hand. We'll get your hand in a moment. But what we have here is that, so suppose we had this, this, this combination over F3, this non-trivial linear combination over F3. Then what that would mean is that I've got some plus ones. I've got some plus ones. I'll just take plus 1 and multiply it by the sum of a bunch of things. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus like whatever of them were there, 
maybe this went all the way to the 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and then plus the negative 1 times all the, uh, well, not all the other ones, just all the ones that got minus 1. Maybe like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Plus, let me make up another one. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. This would somehow need to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so you'd actually get some kind of a useful information. You'd kind of know, you know, like these are equalities across each row, right? Because I've got vectors. So since everything zeroes out, I would know that if I looked at the number of, number of like plus ones in here, modulo 3, that's the same as the number of plus ones in there, modulo 3. And Anthony, what did you want to say? Ah, yes, so, so somehow, th th if you're given a non-trivial linear combination, that's actually how this is going to work well. So we're going to assume there's a non-trivial linear combination because we have n plus 1 vectors in an n-dimensional space. We just haven't figured out what field to use yet. So we have too many vectors, it's linearly dependent. So there's a non-trivial linear dependence. Non-trivial linear dependence means that some of these c's are 0, ignore those. And then now we'll go and keep all of the c's which are plus 1's, all the plus ones, by the way, it's not really like positive or negative because it's mod 3. Uh, there's no positive or negative. Minus 1 is the same as 2. But we just grab all the ones that had plus ones and we pull over their characteristic vectors. These are vectors corresponding to sets. And then we pull over all of the ones which had minus ones or twos and pull them over here. And maybe your point was that somehow, yes, because the sum is equal to 0, I am guaranteed to have this thing. I'm guaranteed to have that the plus 1 times this sum and the minus 1 times that sum combine to make the all zero vector. That's a consequence of there being a non-trivial linear combination. But unfortunately, the consequence we get from here is not powerful enough. Because if you try to look like row by row, row by row, what that means is all of these sets which correspond to the capital I, all of these sets, if I look at their elements, it's somehow I'm, I'm like doing some mod 3 stuff. And I saw Aditya had this hand up. Yes. So unfortunately, if you use F3, you could actually make this thing happen. Like somehow if you just had like three copies of every set or something like that, or just things to add up to be triples. But it's okay. We can still solve this. So what that means is the answer is not F3. So the answer is not F2. The answer is not F3. Ting Wei. Ting Wei. Yes. Let, <laughs> yes, thank you. We can use Q or R. I guess, why not? Let's use Q. I mean, I, I was going to say use R, but actually there's no reason to use R. You just need to have something which has positives and negatives. Now, this is very funny because usually when you do these kinds of linear algebra and characteristic vectors, it's usually F2. So the F2 was not a bad choice at the beginning. And then the next thought was, let's just go with F3 so I can have at least two choices. Well, unfortunately, F3 didn't work because of modulo 3 stuff. So let's go all the way to Q. In Q, I can't say there's a plus stuff and a minus stuff. Let me rewrite it, okay? So if I do Q, actually, I just realized that erasing all of this is a bad idea. It's all back now. Okay, so, so I'll, go to, I'll go to another screen. All right, so I'm going to do this over Q. And over Q, what that means, let's draw an example. Uh, we have a non-trivial linear combination. And what we'll do is that we'll ignore the things which have zero coefficients. Non-trivial linear combination means that not all of them have zero. So let's ignore the zero coefficients. And then what we'll do is, yes, let's let i correspond to all the positive coefficients, and let's, j, let's let j correspond to all the negative coefficients. 
I be the set of indices such that the ci is strictly bigger than 0, and let j be the set of indices such that cj is less than 0. So I've got these two different kinds of indices as, as I'm adding up my linear combination. And let's split them into two sides. So if I split them into two sides, now I get something that looks like this. I'll have the positive ones, and that's going to be a sum of some things. Let's just write some things. I'm just going to make an example. I don't know, maybe it's like C1, maybe C1 happened to be positive. I'm a bit lazy, so I'm not going to make sets of size 6 anymore. But these are all characteristic vectors. It's like 1, 1, 0, plus maybe it became C5 times 1, 0, 1. Let's do another one, C6 times 0, 0, 1. Okay, I did something like that. Actually, this, this example is going to be too boring. Um, I'm going to change one of these numbers. In fact, I'm going to change a bunch of these numbers. I'm going to make that 1, 0, 0, and I'm going to make the last one 0, 1, 0. This is on purpose. So I add all of these together. Those are the positive side, and that's going to be equal to the negative side. The negative side will have coefficients which are, they were negative numbers, but since I moved it to the other side, I'll write like minus C2, but by the way, that's now a positive number, times, oh, I don't know, let's just make something up, 1, 0, 0, plus negative C8, times 1, uh, 1 in the middle. I just made this up. This is, a bad, this is a bad example, because in this example, I could have said, just make the set i be 6, and make the set j be 8, and I'm done. However, I just want to show you something interesting that happens when you look at this over q. So if I have this, if I have this equation over q, what does this have to do with unions? I think that's the main point. Uh, once you write down something like this, it becomes quite clear what this has to do with unions. Aditya. Okay, so if you have Q, you could actually go straight to integers. You can go and clear all the denominators. If you use R, it would have been less fun, um, although you know you could still do it. Um, but that's because this is somehow a system of uh, this. This whole thing, if there's a if there's a linear combination over R, there's also one over Q. But in any case, if I'm over here, right? So I can actually go and look at where I have positive things. That's that's basically what's going on. What Aditya is doing is he's saying, look, these C's are all non-zero. And if I take this particular sum, whatever this sum becomes, I can tell you what the left side is going to look like. The left side is going to look like a vector which has something positive, something positive, and zero. That's for sure, right? And if I look at the right side, the right side is going to be also. Well, they have to be equal, right? The fact that they have to be equal means it's something positive, something positive, and zero. They have to be equal. That was given. The equality was given. But the important thing is that the plus plus, like these particular uh, locations which have plus, that's actually the union of these sets. That's the key. The key is that, remember, each of these vectors came from a set. And the union of the sets tells you exactly where you are not zero. This is amazing. This, is, this almost feels like cheating. It feels like not fair. We just proved some statement about sets and unions, where all we did is we took n plus 1 vectors over Q to the N, and they're linearly dependent. Boom, done. The whole thing's done. Uh, anyway, this is cool. This is Q. Okay, so just to repeat what I said over here, the non-zero are the union of the A's. And also here, uh, actually it's the same in both sides. The, 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 this is like the same for like the union of the AIs and the union of the AJs, because that's like how you get a union. Um, you add up positive stuff. Okay, great. Ah, I see. Uh, there's a, everyone make sure, after, make sure you reload after there's a buffering. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry about that, that there's sometimes this buffering involved here. I'm glad that you figured this thing out. Um, yeah, YouTube somehow is getting more and more strained. Everything online is getting more and more strained as the whole world moves online. Okay, let's keep going. So now we've just proved this really cute theorem. Um, but there's, there's another cute theorem that we can prove that's just one more step beyond this, which also has a proof that feels unfair. In some sense, this li linear algebra stuff just makes all these extremal set problems feel unfair. 
the next statement I want to make is that, okay, it was very nice to get uh, you know, a bunch, uh, to know that if I have n plus one sets, then automatically there's going to be somehow two different indices, sets of indices, for which they have the same union. It turns out that you can also force there to be the same intersection. So I'm first going to write the theorem statement, and then let's go and see what number we should put there. So the theorem statement is going to be that given, uh, we're going to say at least there's the blank. We're going to fill out the blank. At least this many subsets of square bracket n, same setup as before. Uh, now there exists, there always exists two subsets i and j, disjoint subsets, of indices, oh, I should have called them A's. Well, OK, maybe let's, let's call them A's. Hmm. Subsets, let's give them some names. Subsets A, K. OK, so they're going to be called A1, A2, A3, and so on. But I don't want to write down how many sets there are yet. Disjoint subsets of indices such that Now we want two things. We want that the union over all of the i in capital I, AI, is equal to the union over all j in capital J of AJ. And we also want the intersections. Intersection I in capital I of AI equals the intersection J in capital J, AJ. What could we do here? Uh, before, I, before I fill in the blank, I want to actually talk about what should the blank be. Can we find some construction, first of all, that has a lot of sets so that you can't find this? Oh, again, these are non-empty, so it was, it's always very important. These are disjoint and non-empty subsets. So let's start with some constructions. First, let's do some constructions of families without this property, big families. Obviously, there was an example of n singletons. We could do that before. Those n singletons were enough to show you that you couldn't get the first thing. But hopefully we can do better. Like hopefully we can get another set at least. Does anyone have a suggestion? I also want to do this to make sure that people understand the purpose of the question. So the point is, by the way, the, the bound we should write here now, it better be a bigger bound than before, because when I have n plus 1 subsets, that's only enough to guarantee this first thing. This is not a or. This is, this is an and. I actually need to know that there is a particular, oh yeah, this ij, that ij works for both of those simultaneously. That's important. It's not like works for one or works, and, and also another one works for the other. So no matter what, I should expect to write a bigger number. And so hopefully we can also get an example which has more than n sets for which, yep, you, you can't find this thing. Philip? Let's see. All the singletons, one up to n. OK, that's a bunch of them. And also, all the things like 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and so on, up until 1, n. So you're saying that's roughly 2n. It's like 2n minus 1. So let's stare at this. Let's see. Is this true? So if I look at this, I've got two kinds of different sets involved. One kind is the 1 up to n, and the other kind is these like doubles. So if I take these things, uh, I guess the question is, could I try to concoct something like that? Hmm. So I'm also staring at this. Oh, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? 
Whoa. So you're saying that two, say, so say again, because this is actually very important. Like when you really look at these things, it's like, oh goodness gracious, how do I check all of them? So there's one, there's a problem here and you're saying the problem is what? Oh, let's write a VS in between. One, three, and two. Yes, that is true. So I say, a, I say a versus because we have an I and we have a J. And so the I is like a collection of a bunch. The J is a collection of a different bunch. And if I look at these, the unions are the unions. Okay, that makes sense. And the intersections, um, yeah, the intersections are empty. So un unfortunately, unions are the same, intersections are the same. So this thing doesn't work. So somehow this particular construction doesn't work. Maybe, maybe Philip is being too ambitious with 2n minus 1. Can anyone even beat the previous construction by 1? Faith. Okay, so Philip's idea with the singletons, 1, 2, up until n, and just the set 1, 2. Okay, how would we check whether or not this works? Well, first of all, if I want to get the unions to be the unions, I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just looking at this to see what, what way could we actually check something like this. If you want unions to be unions, then uh, we better use the 1, 2 somewhere. If we don't use the 1, 2, we're hopeless, because without the 1, 2, there's not even unions, right? We, we need to make the union thing happen. So if you're going to make the union thing happen, uh, let's suppose. Suppose it had the i and j with a problem. Then what you have is on the one side, you'll have a 1, 2. And on the other side, there will be a versus. The other side will not have the 1, 2. Okay? And now if I need to make sure the unions are the same, the other side has no choice. It has to use the 1 and the 2, right? No matter what, because otherwise I will not match unions. So the other side, the other side must use 1 and 2. So the way I'm thinking through this is I'm trying to do a case analysis. I'm also trying to show this is kind of painful. But the case analysis is that somehow, uh, all right, I, I know it has to involve the 1, 2 or in, in this whole thing, or else I just don't even have the first piece. 1, 2 is here. In order for union to match, I must take the 1 and I must take the 2. Okay, immediately what that tells me about the intersection is the intersection here has to be empty. Right, so this, this already tells me intersection will be empty because I've got two disjoint sets. Now, that's not allowed to just be empty, so that means I need to go and take something else as well which doesn't intersect with it. But if you take anything else, you know, like, Three. Now you have a huge problem. Let me let me just uh, let me write a better three. Then you have a huge problem because there's only one set three, so I cannot somehow put the set three both on the left and on the right. Does that make sense to people? So the flow of the logic was: I know I have to have the one and the two, so I put those there. I already now have two disjoint sets on the right hand side, so no matter what, the right hand side intersection, this piece, this intersection piece, will be empty set. I now need to force the other one to be empty set intersection. The only way to force an empty set intersection is to throw in another set, which is you know, elsewhere in my family. But now I have a problem with the union, because there's no way I could make a union on the right side to have the three, because there's only one three. So that's it. Actually, that, that proves that phase thing works. Um, writing out these particular details, I, I usually advise whenever it's that kind of details, um, that short, just you know, write in the notes, it's like an easy case check. <laughs> I mean, like if you, if you ever yourself wanted to go and find it back again, it's a very, very easy case check. So now what we know is that you, uh, if you only had n plus 1 sets, it's not possible. And at the same time, you're looking at this, and it should make you feel like maybe we can make bigger families too, right? Like this thing was such an easy proof. Okay, not easy, but it was such a... There wasn't, it felt like I had more space. Like maybe I could go and do something much more sophisticated like, uh, like what Philip was trying to do. Maybe we should be trying to get 2n uh, or 2n minus 1. Except that that would be a waste of time because the answer is n plus 2. The answer is that if I have at least n plus 2, then actually this thing always exists. Faith.
Oh, yes. So this one, I also want non-empty. Oh, you mean the A's themselves? Should we have the A's themselves be non-empty? Oh. Uh, that's a good question. Yes, 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 yes. So I think, okay, if, if I look at the original one and I think about what to do with the empty set though, to me it seems like if I allow an empty set, wait a second, I'm trying to think this through, right? So if I allow, if, I, if there's one empty set, ah, I see, I see, I see. You, you're saying you can always just throw in one more empty set. And if you throw in one more empty set, then inside this particular inequality, you know, it doesn't affect the inequality, but you basically have, have one less set. That's what you're thinking. Is that what you mean? I mean, if we look at the proof, that's how I would think about everything. If we look at the proof, in this proof, if there was actually an empty set, eh? If there was an empty set, how is this a problem? I, I, I guess I'm looking at this proof now. It's like somehow, suppose there was an empty set with all zeros. Then it seems to me that the proof actually still works. Ah, so you're thinking, you're going back to this question, and you're saying, what if the sets are, let, let, actually, let's, let's look at this. I also see Philip has a hand, we'll get there. I'm actually quite curious, because this is important, these are important details, right? So here's a, a question we're curious about. If I took the empty set, and then just the one, and then one, two, is that what you're going to say? One, two, three, like this up until square bracket n. This is n plus 1 sets. And if we look at this, oh, <laughs> yeah, OK, OK, I see some hands already. So Philip, you raised first. What did you see? Got it. Got it, got it, got it. So that's actually a good point. And Tingwei, you also have something to say. Ah, okay, that's also a cute way to do it. Right, because I didn't want to let i and j both be non-empty, or else this would be stupid. But if you are allowing, yeah, hey, actually, in that proof, in that proof, what you would have is that one of them is an empty set and the other is a non-empty set. So I actually do like that solution. So I like that solution to say, you know, there ex exist disjoint subsets, and instead of non-empty, what I'm going to say, not both empty. Right, so now we'll say not both empty. And the not both empty solves this problem because if you're, if you're taking the sum of the vectors, this works. Bryce? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think, this, I think this does satisfy the question. So in that case, we're now saying not both empty. And then so in this case, yes, indeed, you take one of them to be the empty set and the other one to be, well, no, sorry, one of them would just be the that set, which is called element number one, i would be one and j would be empty set, and then we'd be good. Uh, so then we can go back and continue this proof and go on to here, and we'll do the same thing here. So disjoint and not both empty. So not non-empty, but not both empty. Disjoint subsets of indices, not both empty. Okay, and then we have this. Okay, so now when we look at this, it somehow it, it looks like you know maybe we can maybe we could try to get more, but it turns out no. With n plus two, you're good. So then, how do we do this? So if we want to go and prove something like this, surely we're going to use linear algebra again. And so what we're going to say is, you know what happens every time you have n plus two vectors in an n-dimensional space, right? Well, nothing useful. So it, that, at that point, that means that if we're going to have n plus two vectors, those vectors need to live in an n plus 1 dimensional space. But how do I get an n plus 1 dimensional space if my, uh, if, my, if my things are subsets of n? The key is that we need to add the dimension. So what we'll do is for proof, 
for each of the sets AI, what we do is I'll, I'll give an example. It's like the set 2, comma 3. That's going to correspond with something which is a it's, it's going to be a, a vector inside, yes, we'll again use Q, and it's going to be to the power n plus 1. And this vector is going to have n plus 1 entries, so it has an extra entry at the bottom. At the beginning, on top, it looks like the other ones, except I'm going to put something on the bottom. When in doubt, put 1. Okay, so what did we do? We just simply stuck an extra 1. append a 1. Why is this interesting? Well, first of all, we would know that there's going to be a non-trivial linear dependence. So we can write that down and hope that something interesting comes out. So there exists a, lo a non uh, exists a non-trivial linear dependence. And the non-trivial linear dependence is going to be like some CIs, right? So it's going to be with some CI coefficients. Presumably, we'll try to do the same thing we did last time. Let's split the coefficients. Uh, let's, sorry, let's split the indices by is the CI positive or is the CI negative, OK? So we let capital I be the indices with CI strictly positive, let J be the indices with ci, cj, strictly negative. And now we can write, write down again what this looks like. So this thing has some positive stuff. Maybe it's like the c1 times, at this point, I have to remember that on the bottom, there's an extra 1. Okay? And maybe let's write this thing as 0, 1, 1, 0, plus, let's just do something simple this time, c5 times 1, 1, 0, 0, draw the bar and put a 1, equals negative c2 times, split off a 1 over there, and here I guess I'll have a 1, 1, 1, 0, plus negative c4 times, split off a 1, 0, 0, 1, zero, something like this. So I made this thing up. I was trying to be as consistent as I could. I hope this will work. Uh, if I write this across, what conclusions do you draw right away? I wanted to draw the whole thing because that makes it easier to visualize. The fact that you have equality means that you can try to use the same tricks that we had last time. Bryce. Okay. Okay. So the first thing is the same thing as before, got the unions equal. That's not new. Same as before implies that the unions of the i's of the ai is equal to union over j of aj. But there's also something else that's new. You also now know that the sum of the c's on the left is exactly equal to the sum of the c's on the right. I wonder if that's useful. So you also know that since you look at the very bottom row, the very bottom row tells you that the c1 plus the c5 is exactly equal to the negative c2 plus the negative c4. OK, why is this important? First of all, we care about intersections. What in the world on the left would the intersection tell you? So, you know, you're looking at a bunch of vectors with the zeros and ones, and they have some positive coefficients like c's. How would you pick out the intersection of those sets? Those sets, by the way, are the things corresponding to the top elements, everything except the bottom. Bryce. No, Philip? Yeah. Oh, Bryce, yeah. Good. So the intersection is non trivial if this row is all ones. Yeah. 
Yes, that's it. So the point is that if you try to add up these things, on the left-hand side, since you're adding up all this positive or zero stuff, in the end what you get is yes, you get a vector which has some positive numbers and some zeros, and some of those numbers are max, they're the max, which is the sum of the C1 and C5. And those are exactly where the intersection are. At the inter at, uh, those are exactly where the intersections are. It's not fair. This proof is just not fair. It's somehow, why in the world does this work? Well, it's, first of all, best possible. We saw a construction. And second of all, yes, the union was cool. That fell out. And now the intersection falls out too. OK, so if I do this, the key is if I add these things up, the sum is going to have some things which are max. Maybe I'll call that like M for max. The bottom is of course going to have a max, but there's going to be somewhere else here which has a max too. And the max, the max entry, there could be multiple maxes, let me make that clear. The max entries are going to have, or are going to correspond to the intersection of the sets. Max is corresponding to the intersection over I of A I. That's what we're doing. On the other hand, the, the, the exact places where they are, um, wait, how should I put it this way? So the, the max, the max value, is also the same as the max value on the other side. And that's because of the fact that the sum of the c's is equal to the sum of the other c's. Right? So I have this thing, and this equals. On the right side, I will also have a picture. These two vectors are equal. The key is the bottom one is also the max. So that actually helps a lot. Since the max is down here and the max is over there, I actually know that over here, some things are also max. And these are also going to correspond to the intersection over j's of aj. Did that make sense? It's like the only way that I could get the biggest possible value is to always be adding the coefficient. Anthony. Ah, how do you know that there will even be any? If there are none, then it's empty set. That's an okay question. So what I mean is, suppose that there's no M's except the bottom. That tells you that the intersection of the AIs is empty, and the intersection of the AJs is also empty. So that's also okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I see this has, this has satisfied everybody. Yeah, and actually in, in one of our examples, that's how the case was. So yes, so that's it. This is just like a super cool proof that is not fair. Okay, uh, yeah, so this, this is how I wanted to get into this extremal set theory with linear algebra. Um, these kinds of questions, both of these I've seen appear on some Olympiads before, and their proofs are probably like complicated standard Olympiad combinatoric stuff. But it turns out it's just about linear algebra and vectors. And once you look at the proof this way, you can quite possibly also construct interesting examples just by using the fact that these, you want to find like some vectors, linearly independent or linearly dependent vectors. Uh, we have like two minutes left. I think I want to use the last two minutes to just say, I have put a homework assignment up finally. So thank you for reminding me. I somehow didn't put that there. Uh, there's not much time left in the semester. So I just put two questions on it. Uh, these are two of the interesting questions that will help you to play around with regularity stuff. Actually, that's a huge hint. The hint is that it has something to do with regularity lemma. And when you look at the questions, they don't, look, they don't say regularity lemma in them. So the biggest hint I'm going to give is do something with the regularity lemma. Uh, these questions I've put onto Canvas, so you should be able to get them. Uh, there's some PDF file with two, two problems. It's called Homework 2. I just put the deadline for the end of the semester. But again, I understand that this is a crazy time. So just please do your best. Uh, turn it in by then. I'll, I'll look at it like sometime after that. And that will be what we do. OK. Oh, and th there will not be three homeworks after all this semester. There will just be two. Scott. Scott. Oh, no. The homework file didn't get uploaded. So I, I, I thought on my screen I saw that HW2 was there. Um, can anyone else look at their Canvas? Maybe this is useful, because I, I looked at my Canvas right when I put it there, and I saw an, a homework too. But it could be that it didn't get us, it might be that it didn't get uploaded. And if somebody else confirms that it's also not uploaded, right after this I'll go and make sure it gets there. Oh, don't see it. In that case, it's not there. 
<laughs> so in that case, I'm going to go and take a look again. Um, okay, well, thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll go and put that in there. And I guess I'll see you guys on Wednesday. See you.